If you thought you were scaling back on your New Year's resolutions, why do you see what Congress is up to? We're going to pass several trillion dollars in societal altering spending. Ooh, okay, that burned up on re-entry. Alright, we're going to do voting rights. Ooh, never mind. Okay, we're going to pass massive subsidies to domestic microchip manufacturers. Hey, if anyone needs more money, it's those poor Silicon Valley CEOs. That, that sounds like something achievable. Now what makes this bill we're talking about today so interesting to me is, unlike most of the bills I cover on this show, the controversy lies not in the contents of the bill, but rather the problem it's trying to solve is a problem or not. Enter the Chips for America Act or the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors for America Act. I love me a good congressional acronym. Hope that intern got an extra 30 minutes on his break. Now at the start of the pandemic, it was microchip macro problem. Everyone in the world over needed these semiconductors to keep manufacturing pretty much every electronic on the market. We're talking car parts, phones, Heck, if you're on the wrong side of the internet, even vaccines. Interesting time for a chip shortage, coincidence? No, I'm kidding. Problem was, orders for the semiconductors were being cancelled left, right, and center. Chip manufacturers simply hadn't anticipated that locking down the entire globe and then giving everyone a bunch of money would lead to skyrocketing demand for electronics. Which countries got their hands on those sweet, sweet components was really up to the countries manufacturing them. Now, unfortunately for us, and I say us as an American, that country was not America. Enter Taiwan, the manufacturer of 90% of the world's advanced microchips. Now, because of their near monopoly on microchips, every nation at the beginning of last year was full lobbying efforts ago to ensure that their manufacturing sectors got the microchips that they needed to stay afloat. Now, of course, it was easy enough for America to secure our share of the dwindling supply. Hey Taiwan, we're not China. Microchips, please. For other countries, though, well, things were a bit more complicated. This microchip shortage continues to this day, which is one of the reasons why new cars and PS5s continue to be treated like they're rarer than gold. Now in the aftermath of these realizations, China grabbed the steering wheel of their planned economy and said, we're going all in on semiconductor manufacturing. Doesn't matter the cost, we as the government are going to pay for it. Here's a five year plan, at the end of which China as a country will be semiconductor independent. We'll be making enough for us to manufacture everything we make. America on the other hand, we tried to take the planned economy approach but ended up with more of a yes and improvised economy approach. We're gonna cut taxes a bit for people who make semiconductors, yes and uh, fund certain research projects. Yes, and uh, put together a committee. I like the sound of that. It sounds so official. Back in June, the Senate passed a bill that would put $250 billion towards the funding and development of a domestic microchip manufacturing industry to compete with China putting up the force of their entire government to make their own domestic chip manufacturing industry. Now, let me reiterate that date one more time. Back in June. As in, seven months ago, this was passed in the Senate. Wow, this must be urgent if it passed the Senate with that 50-50 party split and got more than 60 votes. Now that bill was then set to the House of Representatives for passage, where it just kind of sat on Nancy Pelosi's back burner up until a few days ago. Yes, a few days ago, the House passed this $250 billion microchip planned economy bill. So now it's a done deal, right? Off to the president for a signature. No, in an effort to make this take as long as humanly possible, the House made some changes to the bill. So back to the Senate it goes to see if they approve of those changes or want to send their own version of the bill back to the House again. 
Oh yeah, this is the entity I want planned in my economy. Who knows, maybe by 2050 they will be able to fund a program that can compete with Netscape. Now the two questions we're all asking today are, will this bill be able to garner the same Republican support it did back in June and pass the Senate a second time, and second, should it? Now the tricky thing for conservatives with this bill is that it pits their two instincts against each other, the free market and national security. When I first reported on this story back in June, I was much more sympathetic to the national security argument, but having had a year to sleep on it and watch the fires die down a little bit, I've become a little bit more skeptical to the entire issue. You see, Free market conservatives would argue, huh, I can't think of a single independent reason why American factories would want to take up the microchip game on their own. Not a, not a single reason. Well, I guess we're going to have to give them $250 billion in incentives to get them to start making more microchips. Now, the majority of this money would go towards tax breaks and subsidies for the manufacturing of new domestic factories that make microchips. A conservative would look at this and say, well, this looks like the perfect problem for the invisible hand to just sort of sort out on its own. Not enough chips and prices are going up. That is the best incentive for a domestic company to get into making more chips. Enough supply for everyone and the price goes back down? Well, good thing we didn't waste $250 billion paying people to make a product and supply numbers we no longer demand. Look into the future, China is putting a boatload of money into building new chips, Taiwanese companies are boosting their own production, and American chip manufacturers are, independently of this bill, investing more in production of their own microchips. There are going to be a ton of chips on the other side of this shortage, and the United States government driving a huge and expensive multi-year push to make even more chips could leave us holding the bag. Now, To them, this looks like a $250 billion tax cut and spending bill to a very specific group of wealthy individuals in Silicon Valley. And whoa! Whoa, those aren't our lobbyists, tell me when the coal companies call. On the other hand, you have the national security folks, who are rightfully a bit more alarmed by the way things seem to be shaken out in the current shortage economy. Now, these national security conservatives would argue that there are some national security issues that the invisible hand sort of indifferently shrugs at. For example, Taiwan. Turns out in a fun little fact that no one really realized until the world started burning down, we really, really depend on them for our manufacturing and consumption of even the most basic electronics. Now, phew, thank god there are no existential threats to Taiwan's continued existence. Unfortunately for America, while there's an immediate economic incentive to start investing in production of these chip making facilities, well, they're super complicated to make and take years to finish. If you want to invest in these technically demanding factories, you're really more betting that prices won't have gone back into whack a few years out. It's less strike while the iron's hot and more Let's start heating up that iron a bit and hope that demand still is outpacing supply in a year. Now, To give you a real world example of exactly what Silicon Valley investors are concerned about with this chip industry, let's turn back the clock a few years and talk about the oil industry, something that, I'm not sure if you've heard, America is pretty big on protecting. Now, the year it was 2014, and fracking was blowing sliced bread out of the water in popularity contests. There's just oil down there that we can displace with water and collect? <laughs> Where do I sign up? Problem is, of all of the methods of oil extraction out there, fracking is the most expensive. Now, fortunately, oil at that time was incredibly expensive, and there was no way those prices were going down. 
We're gonna be fracking at all but guaranteed profit. I'm gonna invest my money into increasing domestic production of oil through this expensive process of fracking. These oil wells are gonna be ready for drilling one year from now. And over that year, market forces did what Jane Fonda could only dream of and shut that fracking industry down hard. That must have been some of the most depressing ribbon cutting ceremonies out there. Well, if we start actually running these wells, we're going to be selling oil at a loss. But if we don't pump the oil, we won't be able to make payments on the loans. Frack me. Now, dozens of smaller drilling companies shut down their doors and declared bankruptcy almost as soon as they had opened their wells. What the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors for America Act aims to do is assuage industry fears of a market downturn or return to normal prices by making it harder to wind up producing chips at a loss. Hey guys, prices go down? That's fine. We're cutting your costs through tax cuts and raising your ability to make a profit by paying you through subsidies. Now, the broader concern amongst politicians is, as long as there's a belief that cheap chips will be coming out of Taiwan a year from now, well, it's not really going to make business sense to start investing in domestic manufacturing, unless you got a really cheap idea to make the same chips. You gotta make it so that when prices return to the standard, American manufacturing can still be turning a profit. Similarly, if something bad were to happen placing Taiwan's manufacturing capabilities in doubt, can't imagine what that would be, America would be sitting on their thumbs for about a year before we could meaningfully respond with domestic semiconductor manufacturing. So they would say, start making those factories now. So that's the argument over whether to provide $250 billion to chip manufacturing to produce domestically. Let me know what you think in the comments because, well, I'm really torn myself. Before I go, I'd love to give my regular viewers a little behind the scenes of my editorial mentality. You see, I make quite a few Congressional Solutions episodes. Not because they do well in the view counts, trust me, they don't. Doesn't seem like many people want to hear constructive analysis on things Congress is actually trying to get done. Heck, when I typed in constructive analysis in writing this script, it autocorrected to constructive criticism. I don't do it because it's particularly interesting for me. I mean, breaking down these usually nuanced hundred or so page bills to solve non-explosive problems is more boring to me as a writer than some of the interesting hot topic issues right now. I mean, come on, Joe Rogan said the N-word. Oh wait, I think I just covered that story in its entirety. I do it because it's my belief that for us as a country to progress, we need to see the progress we're doing, hear what people are thinking, and talk about the many solutions that are on the table at any time. If you see the value in this, let me know in the comments and share it out on social media. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First, as always, thank you to my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to join this growing list of exceptional individuals supporting independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, click on that description in the link below. Like, subscribe, and do all that other fun YouTube stuff. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.